Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to a School of Entrepreneurship Development uh, session, Meet the Global Leader, episode 26. And we're absolutely delighted uh, to be welcoming uh, Aurora Belfry from Sweden. And uh, today evening, we are always uh, just uh, for today's session, we're going to discuss about uh, the technology, her journey from uh, university uh, to the person that she is right now. And over the course of the event, we'll be discussing uh, technology, AI, and for industrial revolution. Uh, so to start off, uh, I'm Mahbub. I'm the moderator of this uh, session today. And uh, along with me, Samira Taslim is with us. She is going to be the host of this session. And uh, you know, technology uh, is advancing faster and taking uh, less time to be widely adopted uh, than ever before. Uh, like as in it took roughly 10,000 years uh, uh, to uh, go from writing to printing press, but uh, only about 500 more years uh, to get to email. Now, it seems we are uh, at the dawn of a new age, the age of uh, AI, artificial intelligence. So uh, let's uh, start our session. Uh, Aurora, welcome to uh, our session. How Thank are you? Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Uh, great. Uh, Aurora, can you uh, give us a brief introduction about yourself? Sure, of course. So uh, I'm currently based in Stockholm and I live in uh, in Stockholm at the moment. I'm born in London and, and grew up partly in the Middle East. And uh, I've, uh, I have a, a background both in waste management, but also in the building companies in the mobile and internet space. I've worked uh, a few years in uh, as a venture capitalist and built Europe's largest early stage investment fund in that team. And for the last three or four years, acted as an angel investor connected to a, a Dutch fund, but more and more moved into the space of obviously both artificial intelligence, but maybe even more uh, in sustainability and technology. How do we use technology in order to uh, reach our sustainable development goals and not the least uh, looking at, uh, at, cl at climate and carbon gas emissions and, and the new energy mix. And I think from a technology point of view, it's important for me to state early on my big disclaimer. I'm not a technology optimist. I don't believe that technology will save us from the transformation that we're in. But the digitalization transformation, or if you want, the, the fourth industrial revolution, in parallel to the sustainability transformation, creates huge opportunities. And tech has a role to play as a tool and a lever. But first, it needs to be... Um, First, we need to create a framework and we need to have a, 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 both an intellectual but also um, a systemic mindset shift around living under our in accordance with our planetary boundaries and once we've done that properly then tech can be uh, a very important um, has a role to play great uh, uh, what did you study in university and uh, were you involved with uh, any kind of volunteer uh, activities sure yes i studied both politics and then uh, ec economics and uh, throughout university, I did lots of volunteering. I thought that was uh, fascinating, both within the university uh, and wrote for the our university's school paper. Uh, so acted as a, some sort of early researcher and, and journalist. Um, but also in the... Uh, actually, that came later after university, to be fair, in... in um, no, we'll, we'll stick to, to, to what's been the, the university stuff, which was mainly around uh, research and, and journalism. And I was fascinated about organizational, the organizational qualities that you need in order to make a lot of the theory happen. I, I don't know how many of the students out there are, are doing economics, but there's a, there's a delta between the theory and reality. And, and that delta can be bridged with people obviously and leadership is a key part of that which i've always found that fascinating great and uh, when did you first uh, enter into this uh, tech sector completely by chance i was in the waste management sector so i was recycling uh, if you want tech i was recycling electronic waste uh, tvs mobile phones computers but also like refrigerators and stuff um, which is uh, an, an interesting space in itself. Uh, 
both in terms of the hazardous waste, all the batteries, et cetera, and components that need to be recycled, but also the metals and the plastics. And then that's really interesting. That's really it interesting. Is. And it fits also into the uh, the sustainability work that I'm doing now, um, understanding what we're using for the products that we need now, how we can then uh, uh, reuse them. And it's many of the things that we talk about tends to be quite theoretical. So we, re we want to reuse plastics and metals and papers, but it needs to work with many of how the big corporate industrial companies manufacture, how they use their R&D. So adding into that uh, complexity layer. So by chance, I was recruited into a, some sort of internet business. And I was very honest with them. I said, I know nothing about internet. Um, and they were looking for someone uh, with a change management role which allowed me to uh, to move into what I uh, uh, kind of cheekily called internet. And uh, I've, I've been here ever since, but then moved into uh, to building companies. And that was in probably 2008, maybe. Great. Mm -hmm. It's been a long, a long journey. Time. It's a long time. And also, uh, you know, we'll be also uh, learning a lot about how you have been involved with, uh, you're the co-founder of uh, a sustainable board member of uh, Faro Nordic and senior advisor and so many stuffs you have been involved with. But uh, I would like to hand over to Samira uh, to run the session. Yeah, uh, whatever she she tell, tells us uh, everyone that uh, she's uh, doing like revolutionary change for our world and you know you know within our country and we're so like uh, we are so. Um, excited about this and we are knowing we, we want to know about so many things from you that um like what what we can do as a student whatever we are doing like our corporate level uh, we can do a revolution change for our uh, country or, or for our world so i want to know from you that uh, please give us a brief on fourth ir and its impact on human life yeah, so the fourth industrial revolution is a, is a is a big concept that you could uh, define in many ways, shapes, or forms, and and I think the introduction said it quite bit, uh, astutely as well. It it's the the next, so to speak, big transition in uh, the history of humanity and artificial intelligence and uh, and and data and understanding uh, and the different types of the technological components, including biotech, quantum computing, uh, 3D printing, blockchain, et cetera, is, is going to fundamentally shift how we work, how we live, uh, how we don't work, uh, and probably also the existential questions around us. And because my work is mainly in the, in the field of the sustainability transition, I'm excited and fascinated to see how we we find ourselves now in a, a, a predicament where we need to move into a, a fossil free economy very rapidly, even though we've known for the last 40 years uh, where we were going to end up if we burned fossil fuels. But by some sort of potentially divine intervention, and I'm not going to go too far with that analogy, but um, uh, the power, the, both the computing power, but the, some sort of the uh, unlocking of artificial intelligence and other technologies coincide, which will hopefully or potentially be an interesting catalyst in doing some of these um, changes that we need. That's really nice. And I want to ask, um, ask something to you that how artificial intelligence and uh, business intelligence reshaping the business and culture. Yeah, again, there's different ways of slicing and dicing that. And I thought that was an interesting question, both uh, uh, how business intelligence will, will change and, and artificial intelligence as some sort of um, uh, empowerer of that. And the obvious first layer answer is that we will be able to understand much more of mm -hmm. the data around us. We'll be able to, in real time, take much more informed decisions um, above and beyond what we're used to. And, um, and in a complex world, that's probably exactly what we need, both in terms of um, predicting the future, understanding components, creating uh, 
correlations as well as co uh, connections between data points uh, in order to be much more effic effective. And I mean, there's two versions of effective. One is uh, increasing our return on investment on, on, on uh, from a, a strict company point of view, mm -hmm. but if it may be more interesting being a resource efficient, given that we now need to uh, move into our planetary boundaries and be much more efficient. But the, I think the next layer, which is even more interesting than what exactly what we can do in, in, in terms of artificial intelligence, is that how that will change us, the importance of leadership, the requirements. And we can see a shift, and I'm obviously exaggerating a little to make a point, but we can see a shift in terms of leadership where some sort of the old school uh, pre-AI leadership was much more uh, gut-based, instinctual, and you were um, premiered as a leader if you had some sort of relative analytical skills and was able to take in a lot of information. But if we have a tool set in parallel that will take in infinitely more data uh, than any brain can. So basically all our brains will be insufficient in parallel to, to the AI. That means there's another set of leadership skills that becomes much more interesting. And that is emotional intelligence, um, it, intuit, people's intuitive, uh, team building, cultural understanding, em empathy, uh, because we will have the data and the analytics, so to speak, in the toolbox, and then steering that in a complex environment. So I think the, the leadership aspect is, is just as interesting as the technical. I can go on and on. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> okay. So uh, on top of that, what is the role of big data? And uh, what do you think how big data can be managed? I'm going to be cheeky here <laughs> and say that most companies that I work with um, are mismanaging the opportunity of big data. So we've talked about this for a while. Uh, every company generates data points. You need to collect your data points in, in some sort of database, have a, a, a warehouse management system, and then you'll be able to extract intelligence, and then you'll be able to use intelligence. And all that is true in theory, and the, the tech exists. But for some reason, we're not doing it correctly. And it's uh, there's many reasons to it. And, and I think it comes down to this leadership change that's required. It's looking at um, our companies in a different way, storing them, but also having a different type of imagination in terms of how that data can be sliced and diced and, uh, and used. And therefore, how do you build your uh, management systems around it? So I think we're just in the beginning of understanding how this will revolutionize. And of course, there's some companies out there that are doing it really, really well that uh, that are built on this system purely. Obviously, our big tech companies, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Amazon. But for the vast majority of companies, I think um, so much more is going to happen once we start understanding how to do this properly. Okay, that's great. And uh, how do, what do what do you think that how metaverse may shape uh, the new world? So a lot of people are spending a lot of time thinking about how the metaverse is going to change the new world. Um, yeah, right. and, um, sorry. And, and the, um, I mean, you can make a lot of bets, but I think one of those components that where we're going to see uh, um, a fork in the road in terms of how the internet is going to move um, blockchain being another, which is obviously uh, will be part of the, of, of the metaverse, but our, our internet so far has been very m mobile based. So it's moved from the PC to the, to the phone. And then the next chapter, when will it happen? I, I'm not going to put any bets on that. Um, in, a, in a metaverse where what we're seeing now in terms of the predictions are as the internet was predicted, more in the realm of probably entertainment, uh, media, B2C. And then the, the discussion is around how do we uphold our democratic values in that? Um, there's a big criticism, which I think is valid and interesting. Um, the big tech companies that have then swooped in as commercial entities and own a big chunk of the internet or internet 2.0 um, haven't been able to manage um, 
hate bubbles, fake news, uh, this the backside of what was supposed to be a free, open conversation. And now we see the same rhetoric happening in the metaverse conversation. This will be the liberation of... of of the people's will, of free speech, um, free from commercial entities, free from, uh, where we can build a common ground. And I, and I would say I, I, I follow closely the conversation around if we, the problems that we have in 2.0 will probably follow us into Internet 3.0 and the metaverse and, and shouldn't be ignored. And the other side of the conversation is obviously there's a lot of money involved, both in terms of the investment now, but the size of the potential market, which then instinctively we know that there's when there's big markets, we will see big companies uh, swoop in. At, and as we're seeing now. And but if I add the layer that I find the most interesting, which is the sustainability uh, layer here, which is less uh, discussed, is that in the meeting of a virtual world as well as a digital uh, and a real world that could work in parallel, I think we will see huge advantages from a sustainability point of view where we can use our resources better, but also use the tools that the metaverse uh, promises um, to create better future predictions, uh, which will further utilize uh, or allow us to utilize energy better and our resources better, etc. So, no answer, but lots of thoughts uh, out there, and uh, I'm following it closely. Okay, but we want to know so many things from you that. Uh, what is the change? We can change the world, you know. That how you are working for our, for your country and for your world. So. That's why we want to know, and we have so many questions for, uh, that we can ask here. So another that uh, we know the for, uh, for young generation, um, we have learned so many skills. So which skills are required for youth community to cope up with uh, four IR, for uh, fourth industrial uh, revolution change? Well, I think there's room for lots of different skill sets in this. Uh, but as I said, given the fact that uh, artificial intelligence will uh, surpass what the human brain is capable in, of in terms of analysis and number crunching, that will probably be the less uh, required skill that uh, the mental computing power, because the, the data computing power will be uh, so strong. So it will be the the, 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 the skill sets around that. And as I was saying, I think uh, emotional intelligence, teamwork and, and, and motivational leadership, et cetera, uh, are, are interesting as well as the designer. But I think if we refer back to like, what can we do? Um, how can we spend our time? realizing that the window of opportunity to 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 save humanity to save save the planet is different because i think the planet will survive but uh life as we know it um and look at mitigating some of the damages potentially reversing uh, some of the mess that humanity has created by burning fossil fuels and um uh building an economy and uh, lifestyles. And you can argue that there are different lifestyles in, in different parts of the world, but without um, being cautious about living within our planetary boundaries. My suggestion is everything you do needs to work towards that because that is the most pressing issue uh, challenge of our time. And then there's sub layers to that that play an important part. The inequalities of, of this world, uh, wealth allocation challenges, mental health issues. We know that educating women and girls has a huge impact on all these things. So there are sub strands that, that uh, impact in a positive way. But I think unless we spend our hearts, brains and, and energy uh, on reversing the shit that we've created, there's very little else to do, in, in, in my opinion. And uh, there's tech to be built. But I think mainly it's uh, right now it's, it's emotionally, organizationally taking the, the tech that already exists and finding outlets for it. Um, maybe from a, a voter's point of view, so maybe less of a, a technical, um, identifying 
what type of subsidies right now is going to the fossil fuel industry as opposed to subsidies going to renewable energy? From a European point of view, I find it extremely embarrassing that European nations, as well as the US, as we know, are continuing to subsidize the oil and gas industry with heavily lobbied by um, oil companies now. 2022, that is the, uh, a reality. So I would also spend time pushing that, looking at what a carbon tax could look like. In the think tank that, that I run, we're now looking at how do we help uh, companies identify uh, their carbon emissions, put an internal price on them in advance of, of regulation that's going to come. Because that create it's creating a, a financial systemic risk that companies have some sort of still a, f a free lunch where they're emitting, but it doesn't have a, a, a cost. So that's where I'm going to spend my time pushing the, those types of issues. And, and what I find interesting, because I, being a tech person, I thought that pushing tech might be time best spent, but I think it's pushing the framework where the tech uh, can, uh, can work in an effective way, so to speak. Very precious explained. Uh, th and thank you. That uh, I guess is is uh, useful uh, for our uh, student and for our young generation. And another thing I want to know that we know tech advancement uh, increase uh, poverty in our society. So how do you evaluate this statement? Have you read uh, Kai Fu Lee? Mm -hmm. The Taiwanese uh, uh, American uh, thinker, investor, philosopher, uh, uh, AI guru, if you want, okay. he's talking about um, how artificial intelligence owned by uh, companies and, and a handful of companies uh, in the world will, with the power of, uh, of computing power, become a, a dominant. And it's uh, what we see the tender... Ten tendency right now is that the powerful artificial intelligence with the more computing power and the more data points become more powerful and potentially there's a winner takes all in different sectors with these uh, these strong powerful companies which has obviously has a huge financial impact around the globe where mid-sized or smaller companies will have will uh, struggle to compute yeah compete which then le leads into the uh, the statement that you made that artificial intelligence or the fourth industrial revolution uh, might um uh, what was the word strengthen poverty no mm -hmm. there was another uh, no, word no. Take advanced advancement increase the poverty i said that increase yeah. poverty um and i think what we need to look at this and what kai fu lee says in a lot of his literature is that but potentially the the countries that are the host nations for many of these uh, successful artificial intelligence companies will have the benefit of, um, of tax, which is income for, for countries. And if we, uh, if we look at that, if we, uh, if we draw, if we extrapolate that thought and a, and a few nations around the world will become much stronger because they are host countries to powerful artificial intelligence companies. And, um, if we go down the potentially uh, uh, dystopian view, and I think that's useful sometimes to think about it in those terms, even though it's potentially not uh, realistic always, uh, is that some countries will have much more opportunity uh, to redistribute wealth within its country to citizens that aren't part of this economy. Uh, and therefore mitigate some of the challenges you have, whilst other nations will have a harder time. And what Lee talks about is potentially in a worst case scenario, we'll have some sort of f financial colonialism where countries are, are, are struggling to support their citizens because, and again, I'm going dystopian now, this, and this isn't necessarily what I think, but uh, it's, it's worth thinking about um, where... Uh, automatization and robotization and artificial intelligence does more and more work um, allowing us to rethink what humans do what is work how much should we work when should we work but in that transition phase I think you're right I think there's a huge risk that we see increased poverty in the transition phase and therefore 
having that as part of the analysis whilst we uh, while we invest is is very important in order for us to do a transition that's fair and it will never be fair but um, I think it's a very valid point it's a great insight uh, uh, man and Please share some tips for our young entrepreneurs out there. What are the basics they need to maintain uh, before approaching a, ven a venture cap cap a capitalist uh, so that they don't have to return disappointment, disappointed? Uh, so so uh, mitigating disappointment, I think, is just uh, a waste of time. You will always be slightly disappointed when approaching VCs. And, and, and the, math, the mathematics is... Uh, and you need to think about that mentally, you will probably get 99% no's. And I do a lot of work uh, coaching startups in how to present for financiers and venture capitalists. And the thing that usually clicks it for them mentally is think about it from a no point of view. You're sitting in front of an audience that most probably will say no for whatever reason, high risk and not within their uh, investment space. And then you take whatever much time you have in your meeting, if it's a three minute meeting uh, or an hour's meeting and address it from how they potentially could say no. Because the biggest challenge I see, or the biggest mistake I see from entrepreneurs is they've built something really cool. They've built a baby and they're so proud of it. And they know that it's going to change the world or it has a market opportunity. So they just present the good sides and they're so fulfilled or um, em empowered by that, that they forget to think in a more cynical way. So I would approach it much more cynically. How will they say no? What will they question? Where is my analysis flawed? What could go wrong? And that's where you spend your time. That's great. And please share your views on how government can be more startup friendly. What are uh, the major facilities they can provide so that we can see more entrepreneurs coming up with brilliant ideas? There's uh, there's a, many answers to this, but if I just point to some of the more important ones is that entrepreneurship in tech is a really important uh, potential for an SME sector building companies that create jobs and opportunities. But a lot of the governmental stuff has been around unicorn building. And unicorn building is fascinating. And there's, there's huge opportunity in that. And, and I don't leave focusing on unicorns. But, that but when that becomes the only thing that you're doing, you're missing it uh, slightly uh, a trick. So I think it's a re assessing risk and understanding what you want to do there. But then from a uh, from a sustainability point of view, where we know that we need quite a, a lot of tech to, to solve some of the, the, the challenges and the goals we've set ourselves, uh, government can help commercial cap capital and venture capital to assess risk differently. So from a venture point of view, many of the funds have a time horizon of three, five, seven years time, which as we know is way too short for some of the more deep tech stuff and the more, um, explorative explorative things that need to fit in with infrastructure and energy uh, and governments can there go in both as a um, as a as a capital partner but also the way they restructure uh, legislation or procurement etc and, and there are many aspects to this and, and this is the hard part which will then allow the commercial capital to realize that the risk is lower actually than they thought in these um climate tech, sustain tech, energy tech stuff, which I think will, will support the sectors. It's a beautiful thought, um, thoughts from a brilliant and beautiful person like you. It's really like, is it brilliant? <laughs> we'll see. Please, Hopefully. Uh, say something. Say something. <laughs> um, Mahupe, um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, great. I'm um, sorry. Uh, it's, the conversation is so uh, insightful and uh, so many comments are there. We will go to that. But, uh, you know, like uh, what I want to know and share with our audience is you have been involved with so many things. You are a tech diplomat, you are an economist, you are an investor, a digitalization, a strategist in a green uh, transition, you're a political advisor, you're, and etc. etc. 
how do you manage your time? How do you uh, do all the things within a limited amount of time? So my best life hack uh, is not to be employed. Uh, I realized early on that uh, I'm not em I'm not employable and I don't want to be employed for uh, even though I've enjoyed it in, in, in segments. And the other thing is um, the, a mental shift that released me from my youthful university pretensions of what I thought life was going to look like, um, which was m m slightly more boxed and conservative where yeah, I had a, a stereotypical view of what it would, would look like to, to work. And when I realized that I, I'm completely free to redesign my professional life according to what I find interesting, important, relevant, um, and I don't need an employer. I can create either uh, through board work or investments or um, clients and partnerships and get involved with companies that are doing things. I could... I can design my life uh, according to that. And, and what I personally find uh, important, my, uh, my freedom, but also my professional integrity, which has allowed me to, to do many of the things. And I find it fascinating. And, um, but it took a while for me to realize that I could, that you're allowed to do that because I thought that you have to get a job and you have to have a title uh, and you have to follow these steps. And um I find it very liberating to go, uh, I'm doing it my way. Great. Uh, we all know that artificial intelligence uh, is a branch of computer science dealing with the simulation of intelligent behavior in computers. So there is a question, you know, like uh, protecting data is a big concern for organizations of all shapes and sizes. Uh, how might artificial intelligence factor into this? Well, it depends on what you mean with the question. Um, one part is like the, uh, the, the challenge of the black box. So you create an artificial intelligence of sorts and you, uh, you hope to create uh, business intelligence um, or uh, an analytical tool or pred a future prediction tool. But you have no idea how it came to the conclusions. And, um, and therefore, you have a hard time. Uh, justifying to your clients or your constituents or your citizens why the artificial intelligence said X, Y, Z, because you, you don't have enough insight. And, and there you have a data, not a data protection, but you, you have a, a challenge in that um, uh, you can't fully understand. And then there's a debate ongoing, and I, I think it's interesting where I think this shift will happen, where our need to understand exactly how uh, AI created different solutions is still anchored in an, in an old way of looking at things where we need to justify. And I think some things we will always need to justify. And I think that that will be based on our, uh, our the general basic values that we have. But there's a big gray zone that, on top of that where we'll quite soon, I think, feel much more liberated and accepting uh, of, uh, of how the, what's happened in the black box. But that's also hinged on us feeling mo more secure in how the AI has uh, been set up. And I think that requires a lot of, uh, of testing. And it's in this transition where I think we need to move quicker. And from a European point of view, I can see, and if I compare it to the uh, the American approach, we're we're cautious. So we we're careful in how we build it. We don't build enough artificial intelligence, and therefore we don't have enough to assess it on. Whilst um, a slightly more entrepreneurial, um, potentially Chinese, but also American approach, they're building lots of stuff, and then you can start looking. Ah, this doesn't work. We need to uh, look at how it's building biases, uh, for example, or uh, compromising values X, Y, Z, and and the Europeans are, in my opinion, slightly too theoretical, and we haven't built enough to then be able to build a playbook to secure it. But there's risk in that transition as well. Great, there are so many things, and I think I should uh, go for the comments. I mean, there are lots of comments, I think. Uh, so, so it's a wonderful, uh, very nice to hear from you. And there's another question, how AI and BI helps to build a sustainable business. 
Well, do you mean sustainable from a financial sustainable or a planetary sustainable? And I'm going to go, I'm uh, going to make the assumption it's that finan um, planetary sustainable. I think, uh, you know, the, for, uh, for sustainability, uh, people plan it profitably. It, it all matters. So I, I think uh, both would be fine. But if you go for uh, planet, uh, planet wise, planetary wise, so that would be also great. As I said, I think because we're in such a, a race against the clock in, in this race to zero, so to speak, uh, using all tools at hand is, is a key aspect. So if you're looking at any type of impact business um, in climate, in health, in poverty, in water, in education, uh, using the tools at hand to catalyze what you're doing, I think is... Um, the uh, the the best step to go. I, I love the cartoon Popeye. He eats his spinach and then goes boom, and he can do things. And I think we mentally should look at artificial intelligence as Popeye's spinach. It's a way to do what we want to do, but just like with the superpower. I don't know how big Popeye is in, in Bangladesh, but um... no, it's the same. We uh, we say the same thing, you know, like the spinach. I you all wanted to, you know, like uh, eat that sp uh, spinach, but. Yeah, maybe one day. <laughs> uh, cool. Okay, so there's another question. You know, like managing data is a survival is, uh, essential for business enterprise. Would you please say something on the, on this statement about data management for business survival? Completely. I couldn't agree more. And I think, and not enough companies have understood it from that perspective. And and. And that puts my statement about Popeye in its perspective, because potentially it's been a way to create a superpower on top of what you're doing. But quite quickly, that's going to shift from being something that puts you ahead of the game to being a hygiene factor that if you're not doing it, you're out. Um, so I, I think it's it's a it's a survival play as well. And in the same way. Um, the sustainability uh, aspect is unless you build a company that will work under the new regulations, building the next chapter of humanity uh, in, in a financially stable way, but also contributing. Uh, it, it used to be some something nice to do and nice to talk about, and it will very rapidly shift into survival. And if you don't, you're out. Great. Another question is, uh, you know, the question is, uh, we, the humans, are just a product or a subject of uh, matter to the AI system. So I don't know if you've read, um, was it, is it Yuval Hariri or someone was yeah, saying it, recently that there, uh, the AI has already taken over. We just don't know it yet. So it's been it's seeped into the system. I'm going now dystopian, and I'm not and I'm not sure I believe this. Uh, but just to make a point that uh, it has already controlled humanity, but it's uh, it's waiting in the background for for us to be stupid enough to create uh, the Internet of Things where everything is connected. Um, and there's a lot of sci-fi conversations going on, and I think it's fun to to. to Keep an eye on. I think one should think about it from uh, from that point of view. Um, but this um, the 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 supreme AI and the um, the the AI that can do and understand and jump between sectors. Personally, I, I think we're uh, um, we're not there yet. But having that as part of the analysis and. Um, when, when listening to the uh, to the Elon Musks of this world, this isn't even reality. This is one meta reality, and um, we don't even know where some sort of ground zero in terms of time is. Because if you extrapolate what the metaverse or AI and um, uh, augmented reality and, and um, uh, virtual reality, this is potentially just uh, a game in someone's mind in the world. Cool. And uh, interesting question, I think, is going uh, to Monir. Uh, he asked, do you please let us say something about uh, RPA, like robot process automation? Like, I, think. I think, and uh, we can go down different routes here. One is uh, its potential to support a lot of this, the sustainability work. And the other is the route that, that you were alluding to, increasing poverty. Com completely changing and shifting how we work, who we, who works um, in the automat 
automatization of everything. Big word on a Friday afternoon for me. Um, and I, I think the way we need to look at it is both full steam ahead in terms of technical development. Um, corporates are relatively slow, I think, still. I'm still surprised to see how adaptation is uh, still on a trial and test basis. But then in parallel, uh, think about it from um, a worker's rights point of view uh, and uh, a wealth point of view, because that has huge implications in terms of uh, wealth allocation being concentrated to the top, uh, undermining de democratic values, uh, societal stability. There's so many aspects to that. I work with um, a Swedish company that I find fascinating called Sana Labs, and they do personalized learning uh, based on AI. Basically, Munir, you and my brains are different, our backgrounds are different, and our knowledge is different, and therefore we will learn in different ways, in different paces, in different things. And creating an AI platform where we can learn the same thing, but tailored to me and tailored to you. And I think that type of technology will be hugely important in this transition, both in terms of robotics and, uh, and automation, but also AI, blockchain, etc. Because as we need to shift into different types of skill sets and working in, and skill sets was one of your questions, we will need to re-educate, upskill a lot of people. And upskilling from traditionally has been uh, stamped as a, uh, a failure. You no longer are good at what you do. Your job doesn't exist. You need to go back to school. So emotionally, that doesn't feel like something interesting that I want to do. I'm 50. I have a family. I'm 60. I have grandchildren. I'm too old to re-educate myself. Uh, it's not dignified. But if we create an AI platform that makes it fun, uh, something new and novel where you can learn quickly based on what you already know. So it doesn't feel like a, the failure of going back to school, but being part of something. Maybe uh, the 40-year-old, the 50-year-old, the 60-year-old can relatively quickly re-educate themselves and find a new role to play uh, in a dignified, fun way. Uh, hopefully, some of the things that we were talking about in terms of risk and, and societal uh, challenges might be mitigated. Cool. Uh, our question is from the comment. Is do you see immense opportunity in cryptocurrency? I think uh, the topic is being shifted to another uh, area. The cryptocurrency. I'll answer it anyway, topic. and I, I think the 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 immense opportunity. I mean, if you want to go speculate, speculate in cryptocurrency, I'm, I'm sure there's uh, there's lots of hype still left. And I'm not going to go into a recommendation on uh, investments in cryptocurrency. However, I will say that I think uh, a ledger economy will be uh, is a huge opportunity. And I and I mean it from several aspects, from the sustain, uh, sustainability work that we're doing, uh, the democratic work that we're doing, the thoughts of the metaverse and the 3.0 that could be um, decentralized and potentially uh, fulfill the dream that internet was supposed to do in terms of free speech, um, where we as, as users of a common can have a role to play. And I think there's huge financial opportunity uh, in a ledger-based system. And that, but if you want to speculate, that's uh, up to you. Yeah, great. Uh, so yeah, I can't hear you that well. Hello. Hello. Can, can you hear me now? Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Critical uh, AI uh, has the potential to become more intelligent than humans do. So, with nothing comparable, how can we predict uh, how it might behave in future? The gazillion dollar question. I, I find it. Uh, I. I think it's an intellectually interesting uh, exercise to do. Um, 
And I, I encourage you all to read up on the risks and opportunities of, of, of circularity. Um, will it happen soon? Potentially. What's, is it the most important thing to focus on? I personally think that um, uh, the climate collapse, the biosphere collapse, and the mismanagement of our, our planetary boundaries is much more acute. So if I'm worried about something, I'm worried about that. Um, and I'll use any tech that I can in order to, 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 to mitigate. Having said that, that there, there is obviously a risk in that. But if you ask me where I want to spend my time, it, it would be worrying about... Um, uh, the biosphere and the planet collapse. The list, there is another question. I mean, this is, I think, very common. Uh, you have heard so far, you know, like, will AI take over the significant pool of jobs? And if you look at finance, if you look at finance since the late 80s until now, it has. And I think that's probably the sector the most um, changed by uh computing power data data management and, and then artificial intelligence and I, I think we will see many sectors follow exactly that um and jobs will be lost and jobs will be created i mean there's report after report where they love going headlines million jobs will be lost blah, blah, blah. millions of jobs will be created and it probably is somewhere in between but i think the interesting thing isn't the exact answer, how many jobs will be lost and created, but understanding that we're in a seismic shift. So you as a student or as someone building a career, you need to realize we're in some sort of uh, wave and you need to find a position where you can surf it and understand it will shift. So back to your question, Samir, about what are the skill set? The skill set is being able to be adaptable and work with the change that's happening and not uh, think that you will be able to today make a decision on what you want to do for the rest of your life, but move uh, with this. You were saying, are you an AI expert or tech expert? Of course not. The th everything is moving so quickly. So anyone that says that they're an expert, by definition, will be a yesterday's hero relatively quickly. So it's about being uh, curious and agile and humble uh, and moving with that. Great, uh, Ms. Aurora, Aurora Belfreg. Um, uh, I think we're at the end of our session. And you know this topic, it can uh, goes on and on. But yeah, another question just uh, popped up in my mind is, you know, you have been, uh, you know, like working in uh, developed countries. Most of the times uh, you see their infrastructure, how they're developing faster and more advanced than developing countries. So what do you suggest that uh, how developing countries should act with this uh, technological revolution? Um, I've worked quite a lot in, in, the, in the Middle East. Um, and so my experience w would be mainly drawn from, from there, but I think the, the opportunity, the opportunity is the wave. The opportunity is, uh, is, is moving with that. And I think, uh, both understanding that, um, uh, technology and opportunities are borderless. So, uh, the next big thing can happen anywhere in a completely different way Th that the world has shifted in that sense. Um, and the and the the hierarchical structure have also dismantled, which means that if you in Bangladesh are on to the next big thing, you will be able to, with six degrees of separation, starting with maybe uh, buzzing me on LinkedIn or following me on LinkedIn or anyone else, you'll be able to find a way for your tech to grow, which was impossible 50 years ago. Um, and but in that also uh, realizing that everything is suboptimal because it, it moves and advances so quickly. The next thing is around the corner and you can always be a part of that. So you've never, you're never really out and you're never really in, so to speak. And, but you can create a national strategy around that. Great. Um, on behalf of School of Entrepreneurship Development, I would like to uh, like, thank you for your uh, insightful uh, information. And you know, like it's a, it's a huge honor for us and also for the audience of Bangladesh that to know a, a brief and also in very short time, a lot of things you have, uh, you have discussed and shared with us. And, you know, like as an organization where we are sharing that information 
uh, with the people, you know, so that they can understand what is going on uh, locally and internationally, so that they can adapt and they can update themselves with new skills and with the, in the, with the revolution. And, Feel you know, free like, to like follow people, me on LinkedIn. That would be honored. Yeah, so, yeah, our audience, they can also ask you a question. They can email you. And also the thing is, you know, like people like you, uh, it's a donation for us that, uh, you know, like more valuable than money is time. So your uh, experience in a, a show, like around 15 minutes time uh, has been shared with uh, us. It's the, one of the most biggest donation to us, you know, like the time and experience. And we'll be in touch. And uh, if you uh, find something in near future that uh, the audience or the people of Bangladesh can be benefited from that, please do share with us. And our audience, uh, they can also ask a question through e by email you. And uh, thank you so much uh, for this insightful session. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for all of you now spending your time working on saving the planet. That's my encouragement. Exactly. We promote it, you know, like uh, uh, any business, uh, people should go for uh, people, planet and profitability. Great. Thank you. And uh, dear audience, uh, we believe that you have enjoyed and learned uh, so many new things like us. And do research because it's going to happen. It is already happening uh, abroad and we should also uh, update ourselves and be aligned with the 14th industrial revolution and uh, have a good day and good night thank you <laughs>